It is Friday, my fine friend Arenos, which means somehow it's time for another First Thoughts and Initial Impressions Epic 7 video. Yeah, not really a fan of this one releasing on a Friday, but you know, we haven't done one of these in a while, so let's get to it. This one will be on Festive Edda, the newest Summer Limited that was just shown earlier this morning over on YouTube. You all know the drill on how I do these things here. I'm going to talk about if the character is good, how I play them, what sets, what artifacts, all of that stuff you've come to expect in a First Impressions video. So for the first time in a while, let's get to it and look at Edda's S3 animation. Lataria, you said it wouldn't be revealing. I didn't think it would be like this. It's so cold. Normally, I'm not the biggest fan of the shrinking violet type, but this actually, as a concept, works really, really well. I think that the character design is gorgeous, and I think that the animations are amazing. Once again, kudos to the Epic 7 art department. You guys really are carrying this game at this point. As a bit of trivia before moving on, in the English dub of Epic 7, Edda, as well as Solitary of the Snow, in case you didn't know, is voiced by N. Yatko. Anne was the very first person that I did a giveaway for here on this channel. Since then, she has made quite the name for herself as an accomplished live streamer over on Twitch, as well as the voice of Raiden Shogun from Genshin Impact, and of course, Kugisaki Nobara from Jujutsu Kaisen. Moving on to Festive Edda's stat, she is a Fire Mage of the Pisces Zodiac symbol. Her stat line is unique to her. Taking a look at her stat, she has 1102 attack, 634 defense, 5,782 health, 120 base speed, 15% critical hit chance, 150% critical hit damage, and no starting effectives or effect resistance. Imprint for the team is going to be attack percentage for the back and top slots, and imprint for herself is going to be effectiveness. Of note, obviously, is the really good 120 base speed, but 5,782 health is also quite good for a mage, and the attack is fairly average as well at 1,100. Overall, I am pretty happy with Edda's stat lines, except for obviously the 0% effectiveness, which when we talk about the kit in a second, you can see how that might potentially be an issue. As always, before we get into analysis, let's break down the kit so that that way we're all on the same page. First up is S3, which is let me give it a try. It has a three turn cooldown and you acquire two souls upon use. Collects bubbles to attack all enemies with a 60 to 85% chance, depending on Malagora, to silence all enemies for one turn and has a 75 to 100% chance to make them unable to be buffed for two turns. This skill is unaffected by cooldown increases and decreases of effects. Next up is Edda's S2 passive. It's okay, it won't show. At the start of battle and at the end of the turn, grant stealth to Edda for one turn. At the start of the turn, when Edda is not stealth, dispels all debuffs on her and grants her shyness for one turn. Effects at the start of the turn can only be activated once every 4-5 to five turns, depending on Malagora. After attacking, when granted Shyness, activates Expected Outcome. Expected Outcome is an AoE attack that dispels two buffs from all enemies and decreases their combat radius by 50% before an 85% chance to decrease their defense for two turns. Shyness is an undispellable unique buff that just simply says, Solitaria. You said it wouldn't be revealing. <laughs> okay, I've had my fun. <laughs> Moving on to the basic attack skill, it's I'm Embarrassed. Attacks the enemy with bubbles with a 60 to 75% chance to decrease the hit chance of the target for one turn. Soul burn effect for the cost of 10 souls increases the effect chance to 100% and decreases the hit chance of the target by two turns as opposed to one. So now we know the kit. Let's talk about the character. Festive Edda, much like the character's mental state, is in my opinion an absolute mess. You have a relatively fast unit at 120 base speed that has an AoE ultimate with some really strong debuffs, right? We have 50% CR pushback, we have a defense break, we have silence, we have unbuffable. These are all very, very strong things. But the problem is that this character on turn one doesn't strip anything at least not in the correct order, by herself, which means she needs setup. And I know what some of you are probably thinking, wait, hold on a second, it's the passive skill, right? The S2, that's what strips the buffs. And yes, the S2 does 
strip the buffs and allow you to get the silence from the S3, and it gives you the really strong CR pushback and the defense break as well. But the thing is, you only get all of the bonuses of the S2 after your first initial attack while you have the shyness buff. So if on your first turn you use your AoE S3, you potentially don't get any value out of the move if they have, say, immunity already on their characters. And then after your S3 completely whiffs, uh, assuming you survive any like Elvis Ritual Swords or counters or whatever have you, then you get the S2 proc and get the rest of the debuffs. So that kind of makes her play pattern like really funky, like not exactly the best, right? The optimal way to play the character would be to use the S1 on your first turn and then proc the S2, strip everything, and then when she comes back around, you use the S3 and get the rest of the debuffs that way. Kind of backwards, right? Characters like Crow, Yulha, Dark Corvus, these are the kinds of characters that use their S1 before their S3, right? Not the end of the world. We've certainly had characters like this in the past. So you got to start with the S1, which is a very middling blind, which doesn't do a whole lot. So that's definitely going to dock some points on the character. The Soul Burn being an enhanced version of what is arguably one of the worst S1s you can have on a mage in the current state of Epic 7 also kind of really hurts, right? You'd prefer it to be on like the S3 uh, or something like that. So, surely that means we're going to get a big payoff once we actually proc the passive skill, right? That's the whole thing. Like The S1 might suck. We might have to S1 and then S3. That sucks. But hey, we get a big payoff when we finally get the S2. Until you realize that the S2 is purely reactive, right? She only gets any value at all if she has the shyness buff which only happens if she starts her turn out of stealth. So what happens then if your opponent just doesn't have any way to actually remove her from stealth, like they don't have any AoE attacks or like AoE strips? In that case, you can only proc Shyness if she's the last person standing and she's a setup mage, which is not a good spot to be in as the last person standing. Similarly, if your opponent has AoE attacks or strips and just chooses to never activate them, well then, the swimsuit is not the thing that Edda should be embarrassed about. It should be sitting on the bench next to Benny Maru as a completely useless limited unit. My favorite part of the entire kit is the clause on the S3 that says that it is unaffected by skill decreases and increases. This implies that it actually does something useful against the main character of the format that has that gimmick, the Qual. The two most commonly used disruptive units to a strategy right now in PvP are the aforementioned Qual and Numa and Luna. You know what they do? They seal things, passive skills specifically, which Edda's S2 is a passive, which gives shyness, which is where all the value of the unit is contained. So what's the point of making the skill 3 unable to be pushed back if the skill I actually need to get value out of the unit is shut down by the most common openers in the format? To actually get Festive Edda to do what she's supposed to do, you need her to get a turn, not die before that, and have your opponent get really unlucky and AoE counter and reveal this character from stealth. Either that, or you have to be playing against someone who has their brain turned completely off, actively reveal Edda, and somehow let her live to see a turn. Probably not happening at high level play, let's be honest. So as you can tell, my first impressions of this character are not great. <laughs> but all is not entirely lost, right? The character might have some inherent value. The best part about her is that she cleanses all debuffs when she gets the shyness buff at the start of her turn. This means that you might be able to use her as a reactive punish character against something like, say, C Phantom Politis, maybe Ambitious Tywin, or Death Dealer Ray. 
These are all characters that are trying to debilitate your team. Having a character like Festive Edda that can punch out of all of their nonsense and deliver two back-to-back -back AoEs that have strong debuffs attached to them, that might be enough to consider, right? It might allow players who don't have Dragon King Sharoon to mount a serious comeback against those characters for once. And honestly, I think that is the character's value. That is her most realistic shot of seeing play as a counterpick to those Sea Phantom Politices, those Death Dealer Rays, right? Because against most of the other common turn one threats like New Moon Luna or Nakwal, no way. I don't see it. I don't particularly think that Festivetta is good into those style of compositions. And for those of you who are thinking she might be an Aggro or Cleave character, you guys would have to sell me on it. Like, can you please honestly explain to me how this character is better or easier to set up than somebody like Eternal Wanderer Ludwig or Commander Pavel? Or even Fumir Cleave, right? Honestly, she might not be too bad with Fumir Cleave. But even then, I still think there might be better options. Hell, Blue Etta feels like a better Cleave setup character than this one does. So I don't really think her value is in Cleave. As for how to build her, as always, I want to see the damage multipliers. I know I'm probably going to want to build her slower, maybe mid-speed. Have enough bulk to maybe take at least one hit while she is in stealth. So that, that way, maybe I can get a turn. And from there, it's going to depend. Damage numbers aren't good. We're going to go for effectus to maximize the debuffs. Damage numbers are really good. Well, then I'm going to lead into crit chance and crit damage and try to leverage that really strong S3 into S2 passive proc combo and use that to mount a counter offensive against C Phantom Politis teams or again, something like Death Dealer Ray teams once they try to sleep me with their S3. And before we wrap up the video, let's talk about her limited artifact, Magic Bubble Maker. It increases the effectiveness of the user by 15-30% to 30 based on artifact level. After attacking on the caster's turn, when the target is inflicted with a debuff, increases the combat radius of the caster by 6-12% to 12 depending on artifact level. Combat radius increase effect applies before buffs that inflict debuffs. So for example, basically something like Jacko's Chains of Chiron for example, will not affect this because that will uh, essentially proc after this artifact is checking for the debuffs on the enemy team. Speaking of checking, the combat readiness, as far as I understand it, checks for each target that has one or more debuffs on it. So, for example, if you use Edda's S3 and get a silence on four targets, then that is a potential gain of 48% combat readiness, which seems like a lot, right? When you consider that it is a 50% pushback on the S2 and a 48% push forward on the artifact, it's like, oh, man, I'm getting an extra turn on Edda. But the thing is, 15% exists, so like maybe somebody doesn't get the pushback and they still cut you. Or maybe you get 15%ed and two debuffs get resisted, so you only got 24% combat readiness. We also live in a format where Red Politis and Abyssal Euphine are commonly used and cut combat readiness gains in half. You're also in Mage, which is the class with the most broken artifact in the game in Ancient Book. And you're also a Setup Mage, which has Abyssal, which traditionally is one of the strongest artifacts in the entire game. Yeah, Magic Bubble Maker, get one for the collection, but... Yeah, I really don't see it. If you wanted effectiveness on your character, there's already mage artifacts that give similar or more effectiveness. Hell, the three-star curse compass gives 50% on your first turn if you care about actually making that first debuff actually land on the character. So yeah, um, not particularly good. Overall, I think Edda has maybe some usage as counterpick character. And the artifact is not particularly great. But hey, both of them are limited. And let's be honest, if they suck, they're going to get emergency buffs. So you might as well pick them up anyway. Let me know down in the comments section below, though, how you feel about Festive Edda and her artifact. I personally think 10 out of 10, pretty peak design. But as for the actual character's kit, it's closer to like a 5 out of 10, if I'm being real with you. As always, enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your week. And I'll catch you in the next one. Later now.